that uh, the shofar is a horn uh, made from a live animal, in this case. And the idea is that when we take our breath, all of us take our breath, we are allowing the Holy Spirit to blow through this horn. So that what comes out at the end of this is the sound of the Lord. And so the idea is that every time we do this, we're bringing in the presence of the living God. Amen? So you kind of like want to be uh, in a mode of receiving. Uh, so as we come into this uh, special time, even though we don't follow exactly all the liturgical processes, it is a solemn time where God has called his people to take one day out of those seven days that's special. And special in that we know that if it weren't for him, we wouldn't be at the seventh day. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to enjoy it. So the opportunity for us to be able to sound the show far and bring in the presence of the Lord is an honor for us. Amen? So I, I am, this first one that we're going to do, we're just going to have and follow me in sounding. And then, so we'll just kind of let that work. Uh, and if you can, if you all know, no, don't worry about it. Just keep sounding. No problem. Lord, Almighty God, King of the universe, through whose word all things are created. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
She shows him kindness, not evil, in all the days of her life. How full of chores she works with willing hands. Like a fleet of virgin, she buys food from the grocery store. A rising while she still her diet, she schedules her day. Considering the budget, she buys a boy. Spreading her palm to the poor, she spreads her hand to the destitute. She does not fear for a household. She prays and does the work. Her husband is renowned in the workplace, for she supports him with prayer. Wise words go forth from her mouth, and her tongue teaches devotion. Overseeing the activities of her house, she does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and gladden her, her husband also, who praises her. Many daughters have shown us favor, but you have risen above them all. Amen. Yeah. And then for the girls, uh, ladies, uh, this is for our, all us guys. So you, uh, Chris, you want to head that one out? Yes. Yeah, that stays the same. Oh, yes. Okay. It's the song by Mike. Okay. All right. 
the very latest. Where is it? You gave Where away. Uh, no. Oh, the other side of the race. She gave away a second page. <laughs> 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 no, that's the second page. Thank you. Which one? Psalm 112. Psalm 112. Uh -huh. Okay. Ready? Ready? Hallelujah! Happy is the man who fears the Lord, who delights rightly in his commandments. The seed shall be mighty on the earth. The generation of the Lord shall open the rest. When all the riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness shall be in the earth forever. And to be a light in your eyes is light in your darkness. He is gracious, and he will have passion, and he trusts. And then he's good, and his grace. He can bless his affairs of justice. He will be shall never be moved. The righteous shall be eternally remembered. He shall not be afraid of any of the tyrants. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid when he gazes upon his enemies. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness and the Lord's prayer. His horn shall be exalted with honor. Amen. Amen. Uh, Manny, do you have the bread there, the color bread? Yeah. Sir? Uh, we do need that for this next part. <laughs> While we're waiting for the event, Michael will speak to you like him to And so I will say that. Now, Baruch Utah Adonai Elohimu Melach Alam. Amosi Lekem Min Ha'aretz. Amen? Amen. Blessed be you, Lord our God, King Universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Okay. Um, so I told you it's a little bit like Ruth. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do then, we're going to disseminate the bread and we'll sing when we do that. So we're going to put another road on and pass it around and take the piece off, okay? And Chris, you can lead us in the lesson. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. study, for the prayers that we've lifted up to you that you've answered, and the ones that need to still be answered, for we say to you, Lord, to life. Lechai. Amen. Lechai. 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 Lechai.
Amen. And it means, Blessed be Lord our God, yes. King of the universe, who is. Sanctifies us by our commandments and commands us to hear the sound of the shofar. And hearing the sound of the shofar. Amen. So the sounding of the shofar is the sanctification. All right. All right. Got my brains now. All right. <laughs> um, okay. Um, when I, the first uh, part of the teaching here is regarding the fact of the word for child. And this is really amazing. Uh, one thing about Hebrew is the letters give you a lot of meaning about the word that the letters are used for. So you can actually, uh, we talked about the last time I talked about father and son and stone all being one together and the letters all talking to you and basically telling you about salvation. The confession that I and the Father are one is in the word stone. We won't go over that. However, I'd like to talk about a child and give you an understanding of that. So I gave you uh, a bit of a chart there. And <clears throat> the uh, first letter is a yod. And um, let's see, I think these are mine. Yeah. Uh, first letter is a yod uh, on the right, going right to left. And um, I put, get the, gave you the Strong's definition or the Strong's number if you like to look it up when you get home and then see how often it shows up in the scripture. Um, so uh, the Yod is such. It's the smallest letter in the alphabet. And then these little dots here below uh, tell you they're the vowel markings. Uh, that's a ya. Yeah. So we have ya. Yeah. And then the next one is Lamed. And that's a pretty little dude here, like so. And uh, it's a little fancier there. And it also has the same vowel. So, ya, la. And then the last letter is dalit. And it's written such, which is the D. So, ya, led. So, you see the uh, next word there by the Hebrew letters, ya, led. Okay? And then you hear it again. Yaled, Yaled. So when you talk about a child, you say Yaled. Now, what is interesting about these letters are, is that the next word you see is that one thing about Hebrew is always building on roots. And this particular place is building on the root Han, H-A-N-D, which is Yad. All right? So you have the Yod again. See that? But now we have a different little marking there. It makes an A sound. Ya. Ya. D. And then you have the D sound for the Dalit. Okay? All right. So you have that on your uh, marking there. Ya, meaning hand. Now, the Lamed letter is a letter of every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a meaning. Every letter has a meaning as well as combinations of letters. And in this case, Lamed, as you see there, is like so. Now, when it was done in the ancient way, it was actually a shepherd's staff. And we get tremendous amount of teaching out of Lamed, just the fact of it being a shepherd. It's got it leads, guides you, puts you in position, and that's Lamed. Now, notice that for the child, we have... The learning part, or the learn part here, and then we have hand. And you're teaching a child how to use their hands. There's a child, person who is taught how to use their hands as a child. So when you raise up your children, as you're doing, and you're teaching them, you're teaching them how to go about. Now, you got to look at the hand kind of like... Uh, all right, well, what's about the hand? Well, everything we do, we do with our hands, right? We go, we want to get something, we do that. We brush our teeth with our hands. We're always, we shake hands with our hands. We hug with our hands. Our hands are very, very important to us. They're a way of communicating. And so, yeah, or you get it hurt, so you have to have it wrapped up, right, Charlene? <laughs> but uh, uh, just to think about how a hand is used, 
uh, let's talk about words where we use hand, like handed to me, right? Handed to me. Or it came into my hands. Notice how we use the hands, like it came into something from the world came into my hands. All right? Um, this is really interesting. I have papers in hand. Hmm? Lend me a hand. Any other ones could you think of? Hand. Something else about a hand. Put your hand to the job. Put your hands to the job? Yeah. Put your hands to the job. What's that? I got to hand it to you. Very good. Yeah. Give me a hand. Yeah, help. <laughs> yeah, it's shake hands. Shake hands. Yeah. Shake hands. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Huh? Any others? <laughs> what about give him a handout? <laughs> give him a hand. Of course, there now we do hand out. <laughs> what was that? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, why not? Handyman. Handyman. Yeah, there we go. We got that hand in there again, don't we? Handy man. Sure enough. Hands are very much part of our life. Huh? So children have a way of bringing into our lives because our hands bring things to us, right? They bring people to us. We bring food to our mouths. We do put clothes on. We put our clothes on with our hands. So the idea being here that children, by their being a part of your life, hand you other people in the, their circle. So you get to know your children's children's parents. Uh, your daughter gets married, you then have a whole new family. Right? You have a son-in-law, you have mom and dad with son, and you have siblings, and all of a sudden your sphere has increased because your children were a hand. Huh? Kind of a neat perspective, and why Hebrew people and why in the culture all along toward teaching and teaching their children Torah, you know, put their hand to the Torah, put their hand into this, and that by them growing in that expands the couple. What happens when Perry people get older? Who helps, who gives them a helping hand? Children normally. I don't know how many people in health insurance I know that are helping elderly ones. I just helped a lady with Medicare putting a, a mother in assisted home. And they had four other siblings that are helping, but she was, her mom lived with her. She was 89. And very spry lady. But there's, there is daughter helping mom. And, there's, and she's got brothers and they all chip in on this. So children come along, we bring them up, and they end up helping us in our journey later on. They give us a hand. So it's a beautiful way of God giving us this name for children. Yaled. Tells you a lot about what you do with children, doesn't it? Huh? Yeah. So that's your word for today. Um, and I think that's, uh, that'll help you out. Yaled. Yad, which is hand. When they read scripture, we were just talking... Courtney was, she'd been to a synagogue uh, Saturday, and they were reading Torah, and they use a yod. A yod is a, a long stem with a hand on it, with a finger, and they use that to follow the Torah. They don't touch the scroll, they use the yod to touch the scroll. Interesting. All right, here we go. All right, that's the Hebrew word. <clears throat> Now, what I want to do is address a very important subject for us in this room. I hope you can be really articulate about this, because this is probably one of the key things about understanding your Hebrew roots. Because there are a couple things that are said Christianity almost taken for granted that causes us to be separated from Torah. Causes us to be separated from the law, or past the law. 
And there are different ways that that's being described. But I want to read, this is a uh, devotional my son sent me. I've been reading with him every day. And I know George Runyon. He's a well-established apostolic preacher in California. Has a number of churches. He's very astute, very qualified gentleman. And um, and he just falls right into the fit here. Let's see if I had it uh, pulled up here right. Um, he, um, yeah, I had something stuck in there. Now I have to look for it a little bit. But um, he uses something in his, um, and it, it's a kind of a theme throughout this uh, particular uh, scripture. And I love the man, so I just want to read a typical statement that we read in Christianity. See, <clears throat> in our passage for today, Jesus is addressing the Jewish covenant people. The lives have been shaky for centuries as they built contrary to Moses' instructions. Hmm. And now Jesus had appeared to give them a new foundation full of grace and truth. John 1.14. He came to fulfill the law and thus provide a better foundation than that of Moses. Now, I don't know whether you, if you're into Hebrew roots, that's going to get your hair raising on your arm. All right? <clears throat> the building process is both hearing his words and acting on his words. Did Jesus uh, speak words from uh, Torah? Of course he did. Quoted it all the time. Uh, Luke didn't. He created some new scriptures. No. <laughs> did John? No. Hmm. Paul certainly didn't. All right. He was a rabbi. Paul's a rabbi, for crying out loud. He was under one of the best teachers, Gamil, the, the grandson. So we're talking about well-steeped in what? Tanakh, Torah, Old Testament. Hmm. Well, this cannot be done in our own efforts, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit, which the Lord sent after the cross and the resurrection. Amen to that. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. It really helps us in this journey, doesn't he? Uh, so, Jesus came and fulfilled the law. All right, now, uh, someone has their Bible or their iPhone. Up, uh, that scripture... That is there, that is Matthew 5, 17, 20. I would like someone to read that for me. Anybody? You gets their first raised hand. <laughs> Jesus was the Word. He was the flesh. He was Word in the flesh. He said, I'm not, not come to destroy the Torah. I've come to, you've got to teach this, you've got to live by it. This is important. Very important that Jesus came to expound on the word. Now here's the key point. If you're a rabbi, and I teach you, I'm your rabbi, and I teach you a misinterpretation of Torah, <coughs> I have abolished the law. I abolished it in your life. As I said, you can go ahead and break command at 5, 10, whatever you want. When rabbis are arguing about my new points of law, they say, you, by that saying, have abolished the law. That's where abolished came from. Those guys had to leave for um, some meetings. Fulfill is correct interpretation. I have come to fulfill the law. I have come to correct interpretation resulting in right conduct. So when he said fulfill, he was just using a rabbi term that said, I come, my teachings are going to give you a better way to approach and obey Torah. And nothing new here. All I'm doing for you is resetting how you approach what, what you should be following. Because I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it, and how I fulfill it is, 
I fulfill it by giving you a good interpretation. Does that help you? Because now all of a sudden, fulfill isn't like it's like taking care of it. No, not at all. It means I have properly interpreted the scripture for you so that then you can then go out and do it. A man looks at a woman lustfully as committed adultery. That <laughs> is exactly that. He took something that was very clear, do not commit adultery, one of the Ten Commandments, obviously, and he expanded it. He made it such that here's how you approach it. Hmm? Isn't that cool? So once you understand that that were rabbinic terms that he was using, he was a rabbi, he was using rabbinic teachings, he used the rabbinic process in everything he did. And that's why I find it fascinating to study about Yeshua because... He was a rabbi, a very young, very bright, very powerful, well-liked rabbi. Amen? So does that help you? It re this, what we are talking about is used for replacement. This particular idea of fulfilling is called replacement theology. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah. For sure. We've replaced the Jews. We've replaced the Torah. That's old. We just stay in the New Testament. There's even a denomination that says that, right? But that's not true. That's not what Jesus taught. It's a misinterpretation of the scripture. And so our journey is such that for us, we have to be challenging all the time uh, commentaries on the Bible written by scholars that have certain ideas about who Jesus is. And unfortunately, we have translations that take that doctrine. So you really have a challenge. We all have a challenge. So maybe that'll help you at least understand that part. So if someone says to you, well, we don't have to do that. Jesus fulfilled the law. Uh, may I correct you? And how would you correct him? Jay, how would you correct him? If I said, nah, Jesus fulfilled the law. You guys are nuts over there doing all that. He breaks stuff. How would you respond? Just I'm, I'm fire at me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He fulfilled me. He the word fulfillment. He expanded on it. He gave the proper interpretation. It had nothing to do with getting rid of it. Good. See how that works. So when you're in that conversation, and we all do. You know, gently, you would say, <laughs> uh, one of the challenges you have when you get strong in this faith, or this, I don't want to call it that, I mean, we're in the faith of the Lord. What I want to say is that when you're learning this, that you don't look down at another Christian. You just understand where they're coming from and say, listen, I'd like to, like to give you another really understanding of that. Because Jesus was a teacher, he was a rabbi. And that is a rabbinic word for Phil. Amen? Does that help you? Oh, man. Well, I, um, I had a short teaching tonight, so any questions? Any thoughts? Yes, Donna. Uh, part of what he was saying, too, isn't it? Um, it's like if you're going to fulfill the law, you have to fulfill the law to the full. And yet, part of that is like. I'm thinking about the feast in specifically because he was um, the Passover lamb. He rose on mm -hmm. the first fruits. He was in the grave during unleavened uh, bread. And the Holy Spirit was given in a cause. And then he's going to come again and fulfill the. the so in that way, he is fulfilling. That's right. Yes. Yeah, he's uh, taking in that position. And the, that particular scripture that fulfilled, that's where that's different, though, because the context of the scripture. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's the word. Of, he's the bread of life. He's the, the word. Very good. A good thought. I mean, it's a way to fulfill doesn't mean that across the board. It's just like every Hebrew word, everything we learn, we have to learn in context. And so, well, okay, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Torah, and I want you 
don't you dare not tell, teach Torah, yeah. but use maybe my teachings to help, at, if, use my teachings to help fulfill, you know, be able to accomplish that Torah in a new way. And he, he did that a number of times. Any other questions, thoughts? Courtney? No, I just wanted to say that I think it, in some ways we have to remember the, the conversations that went on in as far as Talmud and quarreling between um, the Jewish rabbis and how many commandments were then attached to the laws. And I think what Jesus did is he covered all spectrums. Because here was the law, and then he continued to declare as far as the European woman actually licentiously the culture. Mm -hmm. I think that's really where he really doubt um, some people speak of him as a double-edged sword, and I think that's what it was. Is one side is the law, and then he's showing you the other place where he's going to draw the line. Because he is doing, like any rabbi would do an interpretation. Right. If you went to Hillel or you went to Shema, you know, in the different schools, there'd be different interpretations. Yeshua's was more closer to Hillel's, and then Gamil was under Hillel. So it's kind of interesting that Paul ended up being underneath him. Any other thoughts? No? Yes? Uh, yes, Paul. It's always been my understanding that the fulfillment of the law and where I've been in error, and maybe I'll have the revelation knowledge of the chair of this night, that the, the fulfillment of the law was the 613 commandments. Not only did he fulfill the regular commandments that typical people would, but he also qualified in the priestly context. You know, that's why he's, it's written up in him that he's a priest forever, according to the order of the children. And uh, the fulfillment of that law, that he was able to do what we had not been yeah, able to do. Yeah, he able. So that is the fulfillment of that. I was always aligned to two. And I, that's exactly right. And he, he made he, he went one step further. He followed a lot of the rabbinic guidelines mm -hmm. of that time. Because um, the understanding is that he never said Yahweh. That he always used Adonai in, in accordance. It's interesting. That's one thought. I don't say it's... Oh, where he never used uh, the tetragram, the actual pronunciation of that. He would use Adonai Hashem. Uh, the um, uh, what's the word for that that you use? But uh, anyway, that in other words, rather than saying the four letters or the four letter Yahweh, which we will do, we I've done that. I don't have a problem with doing Yahweh. I just will never do that in front of a Hebrew person, and I rather not do it in front of Christians per se, because I rather just if I'm going to use it, I'll say Adonai Hashem, because uh, you've got to really understand where things are happening there. Uh, we're walking an interesting, we are part of a trend that God is doing. He's moving, and he wants to bring his people back to the roots. And we're part of that. We've been pulled apart to do that, but not to be separated from, but to integrate in. And that uh, is the vision that uh, Boaz Michael has with fruit, First Fruits of Zion, the Tent of David. He wrote a book on it. But we're meant to be, to touch people about this. Like when you go take your children and introduce them to the Jewish faith. And that was what Jesus did. And so, uh, but he doesn't call us to that. But because there's, what I love the definition is that I'm a Messianic Gentile. I'm not a Messianic Jew. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Messianic Gentile. I've been grafted in, so I kind of can, I can play with that a little bit, you follow me. But I look at myself as, a, as one who don't have a Jewish background, but I believe in the Messiah. So that's a Messianic Gentile, and that's a term that he uses. And so that way we can kind of like, we have one to put people in categories, so it's a nice thing to put a category, but Messianic Jews, Jews, and, and then Messianic Gentiles. And then we have our Christian Gentile friends. So, and he speaks highly of the church and what wonderful things the church has done, irregardless of some of the bad directions, doctrine had gone. It's still worthy to be a part of a Baptist church. It's still worthy to be a part of a Pentecostal church. If you can be, if they will tolerate you. <laughs> In other words.